Great. Thank you to those who are adding who they are and where they're from in the chat box. It looks like we have people from around the world, which is great. We're really excited that you're with us today. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to remind you again to please select your language, as you'll see on this slide, um, at the globe icon at the bottom, and then you can select French and mute to the English option. And I also wanted to make sure that you had a chance and that you saw the poll questions that we've shared. I'd like to ask you to respond to those, invite you to respond to those um, before we get started to read the French translation of the poll questions. It's been added to the chat box and the answer choices are in both English and French in the poll. So thank you again for joining today and I want to welcome you again to today's session. My name is Brittany Getch and I'm a program officer on the Knowledge Success Project at Johns Hopkins Center for Communication Programs. Knowledge Success is excited to be partnering with Epi 2020 on this webinar series and this is our sixth session in the Connecting Conversations series. If you missed the sessions in the first module, you can watch the webinar recordings and get up to speed. Those are posted on the FP2020 YouTube site, and we have also published blog posts on the Knowledge Success site where you can find those links as well as read summaries from the previous conversations. This webinar will last for approximately an hour, and it will be an open Q&A discussion format with our three speakers. This webinar is being simultaneously interpreted into French, as I mentioned, and it's being recorded in both English and French. The webinar recording will be available in the coming days. Participants are muted throughout the duration of the session, but if you have questions for our speakers, please type them in the chat box as you follow along. My Knowledge Success and FB2020 colleagues will be moderating the chat box and we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Just a little bit about the Connecting Conversations series in case you're joining us for the first time. Connecting Conversations is a series of discussions on adolescent and youth reproductive health. And it's hosted by FP2020 and Knowledge Success. Through about the middle of next year, we'll be co-hosting these sessions every few weeks on a variety of topics. And this is not your traditional webinar series. We're using a more conversational style and we're encouraging more open dialogue and allowing plenty of time for questions. So we encourage and we hope that you'll be coming back for more. The series has been divided into five modules. So the first one, which focused on a foundational understanding of adolescent and youth reproductive health, started on July 15th and concluded on September 9th. And we're excited to be kicking off our second module today. And our second module will focus on parents, preachers, partners, and phones, engaging critical influencers to improve young people's reproductive health. And first, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's session on parents, Emily Sullivan. Emily Sullivan is Family Planning 2020's Adolescent and Youth Engagement Manager with 10 years of experience in reproductive health, maternal and child health, and youth development. She has worked in communications, research, and partnership building with a wide variety of stakeholders across the United States, East Africa, and the Asia Pacific region. So Emily, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Brittany. I'm happy to be here with everyone from so many different countries around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm really, really pleased that you all have decided to join us today to discuss something that we often don't discuss very much, which is the role of parents and young people's lives in relation to their sexual and reproductive health in particular. So today um, we have, uh, before I introduce the speakers, we'll just take a, take a quick look at this poll. Um, hopefully you all have completed it. Let's take a look at your answers. If my colleagues can help us to see those in just a minute. Great. So interestingly, with the first question, which was about the role of young people and how they like to prefer to get information from their peers in social media, the majority of you would say that this is actually true, that they prefer to talk about these issues and get information from their peers in social media rather than parents. However, a lot of research so shows that young people actually would love to get information from their parents, they just don't feel comfortable. 
So this is one of the more difficult things about the relationship between parents and partners on some of these difficult issues is that parents are perceived as trusted sources information, but the barriers for young people speaking with their parents are so significant. So I would say in that category, I personally would have said false. I'll be interested to see what our speakers have to say about that. Then when it came to adults reporting, um, talking, they do report talking to their parents about, um, who talk to their parents are more likely to delay, delay in having sex and to use condoms when they do have sex. We'd agree that yes, when this does happen, um, it is true and it can be very beneficial for the young people's experiences. And thankfully, nearly everyone agrees that um, that it's false that parents should wait until the signs of puberty before they start talking to their children about reproductive health. So we're glad you're almost everyone's on the same page with us on that. Then in the last one, adolescents need to be told what to do. Um, so an authoritarian paradigm style is ideal. And we're also glad to see that the majority of you agree that probably an authoritarian parenting style, I mean, I guess, depending on the child, <laughs> but for the most part, um, we're hoping to build healthy and rewarding um, exchanges in, uh, between young people and their parents. So with that, we have a sense of where we're all starting with the conversation today around young people and parents. You can go ahead, you can close that poll on your screen. And as we kick off this discussion, we're gonna be bringing you all into it via the chat box. So please do insert your questions throughout. We'll be prioritizing them as we only have a very few number of pre-prepared questions. But to, to talk with me today, I have Dr. Chris Obongo, who is a behavioral scientist with training from, uh, sorry, is, is a behavioral scientist by training with more than 15 years of experience in research, innovation design, program evaluation. He currently works with PATH. We also have Rachel Marcus, who comes to us with 25 years of experience as a social researcher, and her main areas of interest are formal and non-formal education, youth skills, economic empowerment, and social and gender norm change. She is the lead technical advisor on the, from the Align platform and the co-lead on the evidence synthesis gauge. And of course, last but not least, we have Hajra Subnam, who is coming to us from Nepal and Save the Children, where she's a technical coordinator. And she herself also has a great amount of years of experience, 15 years of experience working in global development with a focus on gender-based violence in particular. So today, the four of us are going to be discussing really what makes relationships between parents and their children, their adolescents, um, you know, more successful in making sure that we're really supporting them to bring them in, into an environment where they can fully thrive, especially as it relates to their sexual and reproductive health. So this is a challenging topic, but we have three really excellent speakers and we're really eager to all walk away by the end of this, knowing how we can incorporate working with parents into our work, because we know that this is really critical um, in, in ensuring that we, we can support young people the best we can throughout their lives, but especially throughout their adolescence. So with that, I'm gonna bring the three of you in and we're gonna kick off with a question that one of you, hopefully some of you who are on the line today, submitted in advance, which is, what would you say, we're just gonna jump right in. So what would you say are some specific strategies that um, you all have found helpful when engaging with parents? Anyone wanna jump in first? I'm going to say, Dr. Chris, you look like you're about to unmute yourself, so you go first. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Emily. So uh, first of all, thank you. It's an honor to be in this discussion and really looking forward to learning as well with the other panelists and hoping for an engaging discussion with the attendees as well. Um, so just to start off by saying, uh, in my work, I've, I've mostly worked with parents and caregivers and adult caregivers of preteens and teens. Um, started off in Kenya, but this work um, expanded to uh, more than 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in that 
period of time, we've learned a couple of things in terms of what works, what works, and um, perhaps just to alight some of the things. One um, is starting early, which is something you pointed mm. out in the poll. Um, I think when, especially when you think about providing sex and sex-related information, the earlier parents can begin, the more effective they can for a number of reasons. One, it's easy to start off those conversations when still children are still young. Um, you know, it's, it's a little more easier for parents at that point. And then of course, you know, when you build that relationship at an early age, it's easier to build on the communication and continue adding on and on. And so we find that uh, working with parents of preteens and teens is an effective strategy in terms of improving parent-child relationship and communication about sex and sex-related topics. Um, maybe just one other thing I can, I can point out um, and, and maybe let the other panelists chime in as well is use of evidence-based interventions. I mean, when we started working, there were already a number of organizations and individuals that were doing, I could say good work to try and engage parents, but a lot of this was not founded on, um, on science or on evidence. And so um, engaging parents and other key stakeholders in systematically designing an intervention and iterating as you gather evidence to refine and improve the intervention is a worthwhile investment that can lead to an effective and evidence-based intervention that will result in, um, in the outcomes. Uh, so for us specifically, the outcomes we're looking for is building a close parent-child relationship, um, improving parent-child communication and, and strengthening parental supervision or monitoring of children's behavior because we, through research, we link these three specific um, um, things to um, children and adolescent sexual risk behavior. That's great, Dr. Chris. So you've mentioned that for parents, for everyone on the line who's a parent, um, start today if you haven't already. So start early. Um, may be quite difficult to have these conversations for the first time when they're already 19, but if you've started when they're very young, then it doesn't become so intimidating. And for the programmers on the line, programming you mentioned in particular, focusing on monitoring or improving communication, improving monitoring of young people's um, behaviors and, and how, they're, how they're functioning. And there was a third one, and I'm afraid I missed that, monitoring communication and- And improving parent-child relationship and improving relationships. So hopefully mm -hmm. we can dive in a little bit more about, about what that really means um, mm -hmm. more practically as we go along, but I think that's a great start. I don't know if Hajra or, or Rachel, did you wanna build on that with other specific strategies that you have found to be effective? Great, go for Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you all the panelists and my audience. Uh, Yes, uh, we have implemented uh, Choices, Voices, and Promises uh, project in Nepal uh, since uh, 2014. So I have, I have experienced that I mostly work with the community uh, and mostly we interact with the adolescent because we form, uh, we form the child club, uh, adolescent groups, etc. But uh, we found that not what only participating the adolescent, we also participate, we have to also participate parents in a group. So in our voices curriculum, in voices project, uh, we target the parent that is father and mother for their engagement in voices whose children are in choices curriculum. Uh, uh, because uh, the ch children are from the choices curriculum, they <clears throat> convince their parents to organize in their group, uh, and we have community mobilizer. We mobilize some community mobilizer who are from the same community. Uh, they visited door to door of the child who are engaged in the choices session and they convince their parent to know what their children are doing, what, what their children are learning. So uh, 
it help us uh, to convince the parent to engage in a group. Uh, this we, we use the strategy, and uh, our next strategy is we develop the testimonial videos. Uh, in villages, the people uh, like to uh, see the testimonial video rather than discussion. So the testimonial video also helps to sustain parent in a group. This is strategy we uh, uh, use to engage the parent. Mm. Thank you. That's very interesting. So Chris was mentioning starting early with parents, but now you've brought in something very interesting, which is parents actually need support from one another. Um, rather than just even just in their own relationship with their child or their adolescent. So, and you've found that sometimes even the parents are a little hesitant to discuss among each other, which is interesting. So then they opt for a video. So maybe the video is a way to get um, parents to feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not alone. Um, there are other parents struggling to, to work on this, build communication with their children and adolescents on this issue but a video sounds like an interesting way to start, um, especially now with COVID, um, since in-person is restricted, that's probably a positive. Um, Rachel, did you have anything to add on top of what Chris and Hajra have shared so far about strategies? Yes, um, thank you, Emily, and thank you so much to Chris and Hajra for those, those great insights. Um, I'm how I've come into this is that um, over the last couple of years, I was involved in doing a review of evaluations of parenting program, programs working with adolescents. And um, one of the areas it focused on was supporting parents to talk about sexual and reproductive health with their children in, in the, um, the, with the aim of getting to better outcomes. And um, very much echoing what Chris and Hadra have said, um, some of the things that we found really enhanced programs ability to support parents to then be able to communicate effectively with their children um, was certainly in many countries, um, group based approaches worked really well because it built a community of parents who felt a support network among themselves so that they could turn to each other with the challenges they faced. Um, many of the, of the evalu evaluations showed that um, that social support that parents gained through um, through those groups was really valuable and carried on afterwards and helped them deal with difficult situations after the the quite short courses had finished. Another was making it a warm and welcoming environment for everybody. So sometimes initiatives um, would start with a meal or um, something like that that brought everybody together as a group and a community to to discuss these issues. Another thing mm. that many also found worked really well was having some sessions that were, they, they would invite parents and, and adolescents to, to come at the same time, but there would be part of the session, the parents would meet together and discuss things among themselves. And partly the adolescents would be doing the same with a facilitator and then they would bring them together so that each group could kind of develop, um, could talk in, in an environment that, um, was comfortable for them but then they would also share across the adolescents and parents and mm. building on that after developing those skills and perhaps practicing them amongst themselves first in a safe environment they would then practice them with their parents so that could be quite challenging but because it was in a role play situation it wasn't like doing it for real so that also made it a lot easier for them and then they were able to take those skills um, home and you know when issues came up again they felt more comfortable because they'd already done it once in that safe environment of, of the course so I'll stop there and then um... great I think that's very interesting because I think we all know pretend life play life is probably easier than real life <laughs> so so perhaps doing a bit of role playing maybe even with adolescents that are not your own perhaps with other young people in mixed groups but I like what you've said, Rachel, you, you've emphasized what Hajar brought up about the group dynamic, that they need support with each other, that having that kind of warm community feeling and having this support groups, especially after the courses, after the skills building aspect is probably really key because the courses can't continue endlessly. Then it's about having mixed groups and having with adolescents and parents. Um, that sounds really interesting. So 
Well, you mentioned courses, Rachel, and we will get, we're going to turn this question on its head in just a little bit. So I want to give you a, um, a heads up that we're actually going to, after my next question, we're going to flip it and say, based on a question that came in the chat box of what about young people who want to get their parents to discuss reproductive health? What about the other way around? So we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. But before we get there, the courses aspect and the skills aspect. Chris, you mentioned um, communication, you men mentioned relationship building, you mentioned monitoring of behaviors. We know that it sounds like support is really important, but what about skills? What information and skills do most parents need to better support their children throughout their adolescence, would you say? Yeah, this is a great question. And just, just to echo some of what Rachel said as well, and to say that we, we've learned the same lessons um, in our setting. We've tried to link uh, individual level interventions. So interventions where we are targeting the adolescents and young people directly with their parents. So homeworks at the end of the session to do with their parents, but also interventions for parents we do integrate homeworks where the parents go back home and discuss these things with their children. Um, and then we look, we've also found, uh, again, just backing up something that Rachel said, a body system where we pair these parents together is beneficial, not just for providing support, but also for retention, especially if you're implementing a program that is uh, curriculum based where you need them to be um, engaged for a number of weeks. Um, but to your question about what information and skills do we, do we find that parents need most? So as you as you know, parents do face an, a number of bar barriers and, and challenges with regards to um, talking to their children about sex and sex related issues. Some of this has to do with their perceived lack of information. As you know, these days children seem to know much more. I yes. have a, 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 a two year old and I, I cannot tell you how many times I'm surprised by the things he knows, right? Um, so that creates some lack of confidence, but also comfort. It's not easy to talk about these things. And so we find that a good starting point is providing parents with accurate information that will increase their awareness about the risks that their children face. At the moment, parents are able to have an increased perception of the risk that their children um, uh, face, they become more interested to want to discuss what can I do as a parent. So it becomes more of them wanting rather than you coming and saying you need to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and then also creating a safe space where they can practice talking. You know, they can role play as, as I believe Rachel said, so as a role play together, they're building that confidence and becoming more um, comfortable to have these discussions with their children. Something else that's really important in terms of building skills is positive reinforcement. Um, acknowledging that this is something that takes time, that in the course of trying to build this relationship with your child and improving your communication, you face challenges. And as you face these challenges, you just need to keep, you know, keep on trying. And the more you try, the better you become. Mm -hmm. That's great. So making it's partially they might wonder, well, who am I to give this information if I'm not 100% sure that I even know what I'm talking about, which can be a bit scary for a parent to feel like I don't have the right information to even advise my own child. And it's something you're already uncomfortable talking about. So as you mentioned, making sure they have the accurate information, understanding especially the risks, and any parent can, can understand that if you perceive your child is at risk, you immediately want to do something because you want to make sure your child doesn't experience those risks. So I think those are really valuable, valuable points. Hajra, I can tell you're, you're ready to get in. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I'd also like to share my experience. I mostly work, uh, as per my experience, uh, working in gender norms, gender-based violence prevention project. Uh, I include some session on positive parenting and fatherhood that is real father. So we communicate, we discuss with them, with parents that what type of skill and information need by parent to support their children. So first of all, uh, parents need trust, listening and communication with children. 
these are the skill of safety net for the parent because this is the most essential thing that parent had to so parent need to develop their patient and listen carefully uh, what the children want to say this is the first thing so uh, while working with children while talking with children parent have to be very patient food uh, most of uh, the parent must uh, create environment for open discussion and make them feel uh, like uh, they are with them, parent are with them, and parent have to have uh, smiling at them to show their show the encouragement um, and uh, appreciation, setting high aspiration and uh, expectation for their lives and educational activity and telling them they are very proud of them. This is the most essential thing that parents have to do with their children so that children can openly share their feeling. Uh, also, parents need to praise, their, uh, praise the children in their achievement, listening to what they say and what they feel uh, with their full attention, uh, believing that they have ability to make the community a better place, encouraging mostly in Nepal, uh, what I have experienced that uh, we have to encourage, parents have to encourage the girls to enjoy going to school, continue mm -hmm. uh, going to school even after menstruation begin, because in Nepal, when menstruation begin, uh, girls do not go to school, they, do, they discontinue their school. So parents need to encourage them. Mm -hmm. That sort of uh, reinforcement, uh, yeah. like you said. Uh, yeah. Uh, and also uh, giving the time for homework, for, especially for girls, because most of the girls spend their time in household core. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the knowledge that parents must need, that is parents need about positive parenting in everyday life. And also the right of child, uh, then uh, like a uh, best interest of child, parents must know. And right. a life is still for child to support their children through adolescence. Thank you. So it really sounds like from what Chris, Chris mentioned, some more practical skills around information and around actual knowledge. Someone in the chat box mentioned that parents themselves need their information even for their own lives. And so they're learning as well. So there's the hard skills and actual concrete, uh, you know, accurate information. But then Hajra is bringing up a lot of soft skills, um, listening. Who doesn't need to practice their listening skills? I think most people on this planet could, could, could use some better listening skills. So listening skills, empathy. Um, I'm sure many of us who grew up with parents um, who, at least in, in the U.S., we have a phrase, you know, from more of my parents' generation of children should be um, seen and not heard. Ooh, uh, and so it's about combating some of these parenting styles that have existed for a long time and really encouraging, as you mentioned, Hajra, um, listening, communication, positive reinforcement, um, all the things um, that everyone, maybe it's about parenting the way you wish you would have been parented opposed to um, the way that you were parented yourself. So it's about changing, changing that. I don't know, Rachel, if you have anything to add about the skills aspect of what parents really need to, to gain in order to, to make this kind of relationships with their children and adolescents. Oh, you're muted. Oh, still muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um yeah, there's, so there's one thing that I'd like to come in on that's um, not been discussed yet. A, a couple of the programs we looked at, at in our review focus specifically on supporting parents of children with learning disabilities to mm. manage um, their, their, their maturation of their bodies and their sexual and reproductive health. And so I wanted just to mention a little bit about that. Um, I mean, for a start, the parents in these programs were even more kind of felt at sea and, and not knowing how they should should approach this topic um, with with their children given different um, levels of, of understanding and, and comprehension among their children but the first thing to say is in a way it's no different I mean everybody is a human being and everybody goes through these processes and their children were also going to go through 
their processes of body maturation and and having sexual desires and so on like everyone else um but but it, they also needed to combat taboos that, about whether um you know disabled people have a right to even mm -hmm. um to have a sexual life so that was one of the first things but but then also these programs focused a lot on on information about how to help parents help their children manage issues to do with menstruation to do to do with um sexual urges to do with sex and relationships and um and so I think that was that was also really valuable. Um, and they did it again through um, courses with parents um, of, of particular groups of people. So they were attached to schools and mm. then brought together the parents of children who are attending that school in a certain age group um, who had learning disabilities. So Rachel, can I ask you a follow up question about that? Because I think what's important is, is yes, not everyone's child is the same. Some some have um, have disabilities of all of different kinds and so did you find that um and i'm assuming uh that people who have children and parents who have children with living with disabilities that they're probably even more protective in some ways over their children and the idea of their child be being sexual can maybe be even more um frightening or concerning to them and so did you find that they needed to especially they really needed to talk to each other um, more than even some other groups or what was different about about that kind of work? I think so, yes. And I think it was that that particularly if um, their child with a learning disability was their only child, then they hadn't been through this process with other children. So it was then particularly important for them to be sharing, you know, that experience and, and that learning with, with other parents. Right. That's good to know. I think a lot of, thankfully, I think our field is starting to think more about young people living with disabilities. So I appreciate that, that you brought that in. Um, Chris, at the very beginning, I noticed that you use both parents and caregivers, um, knowing that a lot of people who care for, for children and adolescents are not there by birth parents. They can be mm -hmm. aunts, uncles, grandparents, family, friends, um, someone in the chat box has mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of inter-household dynamics, um, especially when there's extended and multi-generational houses. Um, this can get quite complicated. Who has the authority? Who has the good relationships with the with children and the adolescents? Um, can you talk a little bit about, about how those dynamics um, can yeah. be accounted for? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, the, the, when we started, actually, we started with a program called Parents Matter, which you may be familiar with because it's been implemented in the US as well. And so when we started the systematic adaptation of this intervention, the first thing that we realized that is that the understanding of a parent is different. We had a number of uh, children who were being raised by their grandparents, uncles and aunties. And not, not that in all these cases, the parents were not there. It's just that the way that people live sometimes, you live with your grandparents, right? Yeah. Um, and so to be able to capture all of that and, and, and include all these caregivers, we changed the intervention from parents to families, right? And, and something else that we've, we've learned over time is a question of sexual abuse mm -hmm. and how unfortunately in many cases, children experience sexual abuse from people who are known to them, including members of their own family, sometimes unfortunately people who are, are supposed to be taking care of them. And so these conversations are, are very important to have uh, with, whole, with all these key stakeholders, including caregivers around why it's important to take care of children, to protect them, including at home. Um, to ensure that they don't experience these kinds of abuse. And we've seen that all, all the primary responsibility of taking care of the child is not only for the biological parent, uh, that these other caregivers are equally important and engaging them is important as well. And are there particular differences, either Chris, you can answer this or, or others, are there any real differences um, 
in engaging, let's say, parents versus those who are parenting figures or, or mentoring figures? Or is it essentially the same skills, the same soft skills, the same technical information? What would you say? Are, are there any important differences in working with those who may be more in a caregiving role um, opposed to a quote unquote traditional parental role? Yeah, maybe I can take a quick stab at that and then others can chime in as well. I think for me, what, what the key difference that we've seen is uh, the primary responsibility for the child, the interest that you have for the child. And so over time, we have expanded our original intervention from just targeting the parent and adult caregiver at home to also targeting teachers and those who take care of children within institutions, within the within faith communities, because we think that um, the interest and desire to protect children extends mm -hmm. beyond the primary um, caregiver at home. Sure. Do others have anything to add on what Chris has mentioned in relation to other caregiving um, individuals, not just necessarily parents when working in designing your programs or? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, I, I want to I want to think that uh, while working with adolescent and parents, uh, we also orient, uh, we also organize a group of Ward Child Protection Committee, uh, which monitor the gender-based violence uh, and uh, child protection issues. So uh, we orient them and also we orient uh, child and caregiver that uh, uh, that uh, the, they need uh, orientation and how to be safe, how to be safe. That uh, even they, their parent like auntie, uncle, how they believe on them because trust is the main thing. Because mm. many of the gender-based violence is happen within the home, and sure. it is done by the their near relation uh, member, relative mm. member. Mm. So uh, we make alert the children. We make alert to the Ward Child Protection Committee, and we we uh, we organize them, and also we orient parent on how to protect their children and may, uh, and build the trust with children that because if uh, uh, sexual abuse case happen with girl's child. They do not tell to anyone because they think parent will blaming them. Sure. Yeah. So, so uh, the trust parent, matters yeah, then yes. because if you have trust, then it can be a safe place right. to go. Right. So yeah. parent need to develop trust so that their children will openly uh, uh, express their uh, feeling, their, uh, their, their they can experience. talk with their parents. Yeah. Yes. This is a very good point. I think there's a false perception um, that the risk of sexual violence and sexual abuse comes from outside. Uh, you have to protect your children from people who are from outside, but, but we all know from the statistics that unfortunately it tends to be someone that we know, um, someone very close to the child, to the adolescent, um, to uh, who is the, often the perpetrator. So it's, you're right, once you, as Chris mentioned at the beginning, building those relationships from a very young age, establishing that trust, those listening skills make it more possible. Um, Rachel, I, I have another question, but if you wanna to quickly top up on that. Oh, just to say that in the programs that we looked at, um, some of them very explicitly said, whoever is looking after the child, then you're very welcome to attend this. And in mm -hmm. fact, some of them were quite successful in um, grandmothers in particular attending. Yes. Um, on a related topic, um, however, some, some programs also for reasons of space said, you know, one parent and one, adole and one adolescent only. And in that case, if it was the mother attending or the mother figure, there was sometimes an issue that she would have learned these new skills and new ideas and values about parenting. But her husband or, or male partner didn't, hadn't attended the course, didn't agree with those things. And so she wasn't in a position of power no, to it. implement yeah. those changes. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that might segue onto a bit more of a discussion about working with fathers and yes. ensuring that they are, are very much part of these initiatives as well. 
I think that's an excellent point because it's it's so first the, the point for everyone on the line who's working programming um, with parents, it's good to maybe look at your requirements for who the parental figure is, perhaps be a bit more flexible um, with who that caregiver is because it might be you might end up with someone who's a bit more um, prepared and ready to play the the trusted role for the young person than if you just say this is just for the mother this is just for the the father but if you're open to other parental figures like grandmothers you might get a little bit further so uh, Rachel you mentioned fathers and I think this is uh, builds off of what we were just saying in working with those who are perhaps not um, you know with other uh, aunties uncles etc but with fathers have you all um, what do you feel is an important aspect in your work with fathers and if you could in your answer be so ever ever so skilled to include in your answer someone in the chat box mentioned that despite being educated on some of those uh, some of the issues related to reproductive health some parents have the information but they feel like this is really just a topic for adults so do you find in your working with parents it, or with fathers in particular, does it take more negotiating, more convincing that this is an important topic? How do you, um, so A, what about your work with fathers? And B, um, when you're trying to, can you convince someone <laughs> that this is um, an important topic to address? Chris mentioned at the beginning that they, once they understand the risk, they want to do something about it. So maybe, maybe it's about that. So curious to hear about your, your work with fathers and your work with, um, with understanding how to convince, maybe convince someone that this is a worthwhile endeavor. Anyone want to jump in? Go so maybe it. I can go first since I'm a father. <laughs> oh, go um, for it. Of course, that's a good yes. idea. <laughs> with your two-year-old, um, so, yeah. Yes. So um, this, is, this is one of the challenges that we've experienced, and we've seen this consistently across country, um, across multiple countries in, in the region, that we see upwards of 90% um, mothers um, and fathers in our, in our sessions. The places where we've had success with some deliberate and focused mobilization of men, but in general, we see way more um, women attending the sessions. And the general explanation is that fathers are busy. I don't know mm -hmm. how true that is. Mm. I think, I think, but this is consistent also with what you see. Like if you go to school and want to meet your parents, you, you find that it's mostly mothers who come. I think it's a traditional um, understanding that mothers are more, uh, you know, closer to taking care of their children. I think there is value though in engaging fathers because when you understand children and how they learn, first they need consistent messaging. Every time children receive mm -hmm. inconsistent messaging, it just throws mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. balance. And so even when we have mothers, what we try to do is to figure out ways that the, mother, that the mothers can engage their husbands. And so what, one way we do this is we provide simple visuals that summarize the key lessons that they learn from the sessions that they can bring home and use those to initiate conversations with the mm -hmm. fathers so that the fathers are educated as well. And then to your second question about parents who maybe are informed but are just feeling this is too sensitive, they're not comfortable um, to discuss this. I, I, again, I'd just say it's a question of raising the awareness about why this is important um, and You know, once they, once they, because generally what we see is that even generally know that there's risk out there, that risk is generalized. It's not, it's not directed to their own child. So if you can succeed with increasing their risk perception about risks that their own child is facing, um, I, 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 I almost feel like those parents would be willing to sit together and learn what they can, mm. what they need to do differently. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have so many questions coming to my mind, but but thankfully, um, Chris just actually tackled something someone in the chat box mentioned, which is 
that in their work, they've seen that um, working on HIV and other health issues that inter-household work, especially involving both parents is really critical. And Chris just mentioned that consistency between parents is important. So if you're working with one parent or another, make sure those homeworks or those visuals are going home. Um, but it sounds like the consistency matters. I think everyone has um, maybe heard of this sort of good, good, good uh, actor, bad actor, good cop, bad cop parenting where they're not consistent. You know, you can get away with one thing with mom and you can get away with something else with dad, but it's probably better to, to have consistency between parents um, and involving both of the parents um, involved. I don't know if, if Rachel or Hajra, do you have anything to add on to with working with fathers in particular or, or both how to work with both parents ideally? Rachel? Sure. Um, so in a couple of the programs in our review, some of the things that had worked well um, and maybe are a little different to the sort of the standard model of maybe a community-based session um, were so it was with workplace based sessions. So in one of the initiatives we looked at the um, an NGO that was providing health education and parenting education had negotiated with employers to run sessions in the workplace and they were a series of I think six um, sessions and, and workers would be released for a couple of hours to take part. And um, that was by far and away the most successful initiative that we studied in terms of getting a higher level of male participation and the the, the men who took part involved, it, 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 what they said after taking part was that it had really changed their, their views and their ability to communicate with their children around these issues and their understanding of the importance of doing it. Um, and also um, one of the other approaches that had worked quite well was um, working in faith-based settings, so churches, for example, and integrating some, some of the parenting um, you're learning and advice through um through regular sessions that happened at the church um right so, so that i just stopped with those couple of things that's two excellent points so the place matters chris mentioned if things are based at the school it seems like oftentimes it's mothers or or, or women who are coming rachel's saying that maybe workplace locations faith locations churches mosques to other temples um that that might be an opportunity to make sure you're reaching men because just that's where they are. <laughs> um, and it's good to, to meet them where they are. So those, those are two good tips for those wanting to work more with, with fathers. Hajra? Uh, yeah, I want to add something that is uh, in Nepal context, uh, lack of knowledge and ignorance about gender equality due to patriarchy society. Uh, they ignore the child issues so and also uh, the ignoring the gender norms issues etc so in 2013 save the children piloted the fatherhood project that is real father and it works it works uh, we organized the father group and they are very excited because they said that they listen they know about only child club mother group beneficiary mm -hmm. group but they don't know about the father group um, by piloting the father fatherhood project they are very excited and they are, uh, they uh, they work a lot of initiative on uh, from their uh, fatherhood group so it is very good if we organize a father group so that we can orient them on gender norms and gender behavior change and behavior change on gender norms it works because because of the patriarchy society, first father convinces on changing the gender norms in positive behavior, it will work. So my opinion is uh, organizing, not only organizing mother group or child, child group, we also organize father group. Mm. Thank you. That's a great point because I know from my own experience of working that actually the women that I've worked with have said, I, the burden is actually all on me because now I'm attending about five different groups that different NGOs have set up for mothers and women. 
Um, but now the burden is on me for the savings and loans group, for the farming collective, for all of these different groups, and where are the men? Um, and 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 you're I'm so you're you're right. I think others would love to see. We'll be sure to follow up with um, on this session with all you know materials and reports from programs like the Real Fathers. I'm we only actually have a few minutes left. Um, the conversation has been so good. I know I could keep talking to you all, all morning um, on my side of the or afternoon here, but, um, but I will, uh, want someone brought up something interesting in the chat box about sustainability. And I don't know if you all could speak to this because um, my understanding, and you all are more of the expert on, on the parenting piece, is that can we see intergenerational change? Um, do we know that what is really sustainable is when you have good parents working with, with I know good parents is maybe a little difficult to define, but, but in general, parents who have these listening skills, who have the trust, who have the relationships with their children and their adolescents, do we, do we know that this is a sustainable approach? Are there intergenerational um, changes? Um, is it too early to tell because we haven't been doing this work for long enough? What can we say about sustainability and working with parents um, to, to make these kinds of changes we're hoping to see in all of our communities around the world? Asha? Yes, uh, in the sustainability part, uh, uh, we, uh, in community, we must form the parent groups, not only parent group, also the child group. And uh, we have to link each other because we are conducting session with the child. And in Save the Children, we have the curriculum on adolescent development curriculum where we uh, we orient them on uh, gender norms gender based violence child protection and reproductive health etc and life skill too so they learn they get knowledge on it but not only giving the knowledge with the children for two children we must give the knowledge to uh, what their children are learning in child club so mm -hmm. we have to form parents group and we also educate them. We also give the knowledge on positive parenting and the rights of child. And also we, uh, we inform them what their, their, what their ch children are learning. And uh, in child club, when we uh, conduct the session, we give the talks that, okay, you go to this home and talk with your parent about this session. And we also have the session with parent and we said, okay, uh, mm -hmm. you do conversation with your child. So this make a very good relationship. Right. Intergenerational between, uh, exchange. Yeah. 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 And, and, and it makes the environment of the family is very good. That is a happy family, a happy child, etc. So for sustainable, we have to uh, work with children and parent parallelly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So work with them together and um, to, to hope for a good exchange. But in addition to that, I don't know, Chris and, and Rachel, if you have anything to add about beyond the immediate generation you're working with, are we seeing um, working with parents as having kind of multiple generational effects um, or is it still too early to really know what happens there? Yeah, I'm really interested to hear what Rachel, Rachel's perspective and experience on this. But um, for my, I would say that this is this is an area we need to to watch and perhaps be able to document better, just from conceptual understanding of it, like you say, because we are not just targeting the individual parents who are participating in these interventions. A critical outcome here is also changing social norms, mm -hmm. and so hopefully, as we begin to shape this. Um, these norms, then um, we are hoping that this will be sustainable. This will then become the standard way of parenting. Um, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Rachel? I mean, 
I think you've really pointed to a knowledge gap. Um, certainly our review found that nobody, no evaluations really went back after any length of time to find out how far um, people had been able to carry on their new learning and certainly not whether it was carrying through to another generation. Mm. I think the programs like the one that Chris works on have now have a long history and you know potentially there's an opportunity there to be able to start to see if it is having a, an impact on the next generation, you know, if it was possible to go back to the first families that that took part um but you know in some i do think it's a knowledge gap i also wanted to pick up on what chris said about changing social norms because um i mean that's an absolutely you know vital you know, that's how sustainability will happen and just on one positive note on that it's not exactly that um you know the, uh, evidence of a program changing norms but it is evidence of one of these programs getting a life of its own so so one of the programs we looked at in south africa um after people had taken part in the the parenting program they started running off their own bat initiatives of their own mm. again it was through through churches because that was the sort of appropriate institution in the community but it meant that the, the benefits of the the program spilled over to a much larger group and that's perhaps another approach to sustainability that it's spreading out far and wide as well as across the generations. Mm. So it's spread on its own organically, mm -hmm. not because yeah. of some formal training of trainers model, but just because parents trying to help other parents be better, do better and support their, their children and adolescents, especially on these difficult topics related to their reproductive health. I am so pleased that we were able to have this important conversation today. Um, Rachel, Chris, Haja, thank you so much for sharing all of your insights and your, your tips with all of us. Um, thankfully, in case everyone on the line um, doesn't have such a good memory, you don't have to worry because we're going to be sending out a blog with um, all the kind of key links and information to many of the evidence um, and, and data and research that was referenced today from, from the different projects that our speakers have worked on as well as some other guides. I would like to, as a final plug before Brittany um, comes back in and joins us, um, I wanted to reiterate that all of us working in, with young people and with reproductive health in particular, I would encourage everyone who has an adolescent in their life or a young person, Chris even only has a two-year-old. Um, and so I would just encourage everyone, don't just be an advocate in your work, be an advocate in your personal life. Um, you have to walk the walk. You can't just talk the talk. So the next time you see your, your cousin, your young cousin, your niece, your nephew, your child, your adolescent, please um, do the best you can to, to bring up these conversations. I know I've met too many people who are strong advocates, but then when they get home, they get a little nervous and they don't bring up these topics. So I would encourage you all to, to, to um, challenge yourselves to, to bring this home to your homes um, as well, not just in your work. So that's my plug to everyone. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. And before you drop off, Brittany is going to tell us a little bit about what comes next. Brittany, do you want to come back in? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Emily, so much. This was a really interesting conversation and we learned a lot of different interesting points, I think. It's been a great hour with you all. Please, we encourage you to join us for the next session. Um, our next session will be on November 18th at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the next session will be focused on preachers. So as you know, today we focused on parents and them as critical influencers. Next time we're gonna look at preachers and them as critical influencers. So really hope that we will see you on November 18th at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to discuss preachers. And we also encourage you to follow um, FP2020 as well as Knowledge Success. Um, so you can follow FP2020 at these um, handles that you see here. Um, and you can follow Knowledge Success as, at the handles that you see here as well. Um, so we really encourage you to you know, continue this conversation, continue engaging. Um, in this conversation and this discussion. And um, we want to thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this last hour. It's been a great discussion and we will see you next time on November 18th.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. It was a pleasure to be on this call. Thank you all for your great questions. And, and thank you for being such a great panel to be with. Yes. Thank you so much, Rachel and out. Chris and Hajra. Thanks for your good work. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.